title of this um, of the next um, paper is Crypto Analysis of Video. Uh, the, the author is uh, Gate Luman from the University Catholic Luman. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to talk about uh, analysis of YDM. So first, uh, a bit of introduction. I'm going to talk about white block ciphers. Uh, so if you want to use a block cipher in an application, most block ciphers available are the block size of 128 bits, sometimes even smaller for uh, lightweight designs. But maybe you need larger block size, uh, maybe because you have a lot of data to encrypt with a single key, and when you reach uh, the square root of your block size, you start to have problems. Uh, maybe you want a large block size because you want just some kind of crazy high security and you want a really, really large key. Or maybe a better reason is if you want to design a hash function when you, when you need uh, a relatively large size because you have, uh, again, a square root problem. So if you look at what's available for uh, wide block ciphers, uh, you have a few options. So if you want something that's uh, close to a standard, you can use Rindle with larger block sizes. So it's not standardized as AES, but it's almost the same, so it's probably good. Uh, you can look at some designs used for hash functions design. For instance, Freefish is using the Shafrik and Let's Game. It's probably quite good. And another option is to look at specific design, uh, for instance, YDEA. That's, that's the one I'm going to talk about. So what is uh, YDEA? It's a white block cipher based on idea. It's been designed by uh, Juno and Mike and presented in, uh, at FSC four years ago. The main motivation, uh, again, is to build a hash function, but it's still uh, presented as a block cipher. So first, uh, let's look at idea. So idea is uh, a block cipher designed by Lion in 1991, so it's a pretty old design, more than 20 years old. And it's still mostly unbroken. There are some weak key problems, but no, no real, uh, real break of idea. So idea uh, is based on this kind of structure. So it's uh, it's called the line assay structure, and it's a bit similar to a Feistel design, but uh, kind of different. And you have basically four registers, which are all 16 bits. So that makes a 64-bit block. And then you have uh, this kind of structure where you first XOR uh, the values two by two, you get some inputs, and then you have this uh, block of computation where you have additions and uh, multiplications, and then the output is again XOR uh, somewhere in the output. So you, you have eight and a half rounds of this, and uh, an important feature is that you mix different operations which are defined over uh, various algebraic structures, so they're supposed to be uh, more or less incompatible. You have additions, modular additions, you have bitwise XOR, and you have a multiplication modulated to the 16 plus 1. So this is IDEA. So uh, what, what does WIDEA looks like? Basically what you do is you have several copies of IDEA in parallel. So you have uh, W copies here, so this is the first one, then you have one kind of behind in this picture. So you have those W copies, and you make them interact. Because of course if they are completely independent, it's not going to be very good. So you have this uh, M here, it's an MDS matrix, and it's used to diffuse the values from one uh, IDEA instance to, to the other ones. There are uh, mostly two designs, YDEA4 and YDEA8, which is a 256-bit block cipher and a 5 bit block cipher. As you look at the implementation, it's uh, 
uh, quite efficient because you can do this using uh, vector instructions, for instance, SSC instructions. And then you can do uh, all the IDA instances in, uh, in the same time, and then it's, uh, it's pretty fast. So that's uh, the, the design of a double UIDA. And the, the main reason uh, why this was proposed is that it's kind of expected that it will be about as good as IDEA because it uh, follows the same kind of uh, philosophy. So you still have full diffusion after only one round, and you're still mixing uh, incompatible operations. So now you have one more operation because the MTS matrix is defined over a finite field. So you also have the, the finite field operation, but it's still uh, a new algebraic structure. So it's still expected to have uh, lots of weird interactions between those structures. It should, it should be pretty good. If you look at uh, previous analysis, so there's been two very recent papers uh, looking at YDEA. And what they do basically is look at classes of weak keys. So it's known that for uh, the, uh, the original idea of a weak keys problem, and for this W idea, the key schedule has been modified, so it was expected that there wouldn't be this issue, but it turns out that there is still, uh, still a problem with weak keys. And this can be extended to uh, conditional type if you uh, turn WIDA into a hash function, then you can break the compression function using this. <coughs> so that's uh, the status of WIDA. So it's, <coughs> there are a few problems with weak keys, but more or less, uh, so far, it seems good. So uh, now I'm going to present our new, new attack on uh, WIDA, and it's based on a truncated differential. So what does it mean? Uh, we're going to do something like a differential attack, so we look at a pair of uh, plain text. And what we try to do is keep a single slice active, so a single idea instance, and we want the difference to not spread to the other one. Because if we can do this, then we just have one, uh, one idea to look at. It's going to be a lot easier. Uh, of course, the design is supposed to prevent this, so how is it going to work? So uh, if you look at W idea and you have one active uh, input slice here, so the, the red values are active. So here only the first slice is active and the, uh, the one in the back are inactive initially. And so everything here will be active and then you get to this MGS matrix. And yes, MGS matrix will be active because the input is active and then all the outputs become active because it's MDS. And then all the, the lines are active and you get differences everywhere. So it's not, uh, not very good. Because the input here is active. So now, would it be possible that the input is not active? Uh, of course, yes, it's possible. If we just have differences here, well, with some probability, this difference is zero here. And it's a 16-bit value, so it's only a probability of 2 to the minus 16. So it's not even very expensive to get this not to be active. So the reason here is that this diffusion with the MTS matrix, it takes a relatively small input. There's only 16 bit of input. So we can just kill it. We can just assume that this difference will be zero. And when this happens, the MGS matrix is inactive, and then you don't get any diffusions to the, the other uh, IDA instances. And you, you stay with a single active slice. So that's how we get this uh, truncated differential here. So if we just go through one round of a W idea, the probability is 2 to the minus 60, because we just want to kill one 16 bit value. Now if, we, if we go to the, through the full uh, W idea, we have eight times this MGS matrix, so we just, passed, we just pay a probability of 2 to the minus 28. So it's a low probability, but it's not very low. It's, uh, it's, it's actually quite good for, for large block cipher like, like this. Uh, so that's really the, the main problem of the design. This, the input to the MGS matrix is relatively small, so we can just kill it. And, uh, now, how do we use this to get an attack? So we have this truncated try for the full version. And now what we're going to use is uh, what we call a structure of length text. It's a, it's a nice trick in order to get the complexity down. What we do is we take a set of plain text and we use all the possible values for one 16-bit uh, block. So one, uh, one idea instance will take all possible values of the plain text, and the rest here is fixed to some constant. This defines a set of 2 to the 64 plain texts. And when you take any two plain texts in this set, uh, this, any pair will give you a candidate for the, for the truncated differential because all those values here will be inactive, they're the same constant, and here you will have some difference, which is uh, in those four values. So with only 2 to the 64 plain text, you have 2 to the 127 candidates. And then if you do it twice, you expect that you will have one, uh, one good pair for, for the full W idea. So basically what you get is a distinguisher with complexity to the 65, so that's, that's uh, a pretty strong distinguisher. And because the probability is uh, pretty high, you have some very strong filtering, and you, don't, you will not, not have any wrong pairs. So you don't have to care about this. As soon as you get one pair, 
you can uh, pretty safely assume that it's following the train. So that's a distinguisher. So we have this uh, very efficient distinguisher for the WIT. Now, can we do something more than this? Uh, of course, what we want to do when we type a block cipher is a key recover. So can we extend this to a key recover? Well, actually, yes, we'll be able to do this. And the way we do this is we try to extract information directly from the right here from, from the differential. We're not going to use partial decryption because this would uh, increase the complexity. So we just take the right pairs and then extract the information from them. So how do we do this? Uh, we're going to look at how the values are computed inside the cipher. And we know that if a pair is following the tray, then the input to the MDS matrix is inactive. So we can just express it. So we call this value D, the input of the MDS matrix. And it can be expressed as uh, this value in terms of the plain text and the key. And what we know is, as soon as we have the right pairs, then this D value is equal to D prime. And this gives us some filtering on the key involved in this expression. So we have five keywords involved here, so we'll get a filtering on those five keywords. So if you do a simple analysis, you expect that if you have five uh, right pairs, you will get a single key candidate. But when we perform some experiments, we implemented the attack, and uh, it turns out that you need actually a little bit more. So you need about eight pairs. So it's a very small increase. Another uh, problem we noticed when implementing is that there's one bit of the key that we cannot recover. So the most significant bit of Z1, which is here, has a completely linear effect on D. So uh, it will have the same effect on D and on D prime. So when you uh, want D to be equal to D prime, this bit doesn't affect it. So you're not going to recover it. But that's just one bit, so it's not, uh, not a very big issue. So, so uh, yeah, so that's the main idea. <laughs> have some filtering on those five keywords. So we're going to recover them from um, so this filtering, if we look more precisely, it looks like this. We have this expression for D, this expression for T prime. Now, we'd like to do this filtering efficiently. So what we do is we will uh, rewrite this a little bit. And we take this term, we put it to the right side, and this term to the left, left side. And we get this new equation. And this form is much nicer, because now you can see that on the left-hand side, you only have Z0, Z2, Z4, the same here. And on the right-hand side, you only have Z1, Z3. And when you do this, you can use a kind of meet-in-the-middle technique. Now we're going to compute this f function for all possible choices of z0, z2, z4. This g function for all possible choices of z1, z3. We will build two uh, large tables for all key candidates, and then we just look for matches in the table. And we know that the right key will be one of those match. And when we do this, the complexity is only 2 to the 48, because we only have two, two go over three different keywords. So we, have, uh, so we, will, we will get a very efficient so, uh, so far I'm only looking at one slice of idea, so we're only going to recover the key in uh, one, one slice. But of course we can do the same in each slice, so we use four different trays like this, and each tray will have one active slice and will recover the key of a different slice. So we do it four times, or eight times, depending on the, the size of the block cipher we are attacking. And we can just do them one by one, and we recover the corresponding key one by one. And when we do it, uh, total complexity will be 2 times uh, 2 to 48, and we get the keys in, uh, in all instances for the first round. Now let's move to the second round. Uh, so we can now assume that we know the full key for the first round. There are just a few missing bits, like I said earlier, but we're just going to guess them, so it's not a problem. And now we can go up to the MDS matrix. And now we know the full input of this MDS matrix. So we can just compute the effect of the matrix, just compute the output, then we can go back to a single active slice. For the first round, we do the slices one by one. Then we get the full input of the MTS, compute the output. But now we can again look at the slices one by one. So when we look at uh, the first slice again here, there is uh, one key Z5 that we don't know yet. So again, we guess it. And when we guess this one, we can compute the full values here after one round. And then we can just attack the second round. And we know the full input of the second round. And we can just use the same attack as earlier. So now the complexity will be uh, 2 to the 64 because we have one more key to guess. <clears throat> so uh, you can write the full algorithm. It's relatively simple. So for, for the first round, we just have to iterate over k1, k3. Then k0, k2, k4. We build two tables. We look for matches of the key. Then we go to the second round. Here we have a, bit, a few more loops because we have to guess the missing bits. Then we have to guess k5. And then we do the same. Uh, so in the end, we get the full keys for, uh, for the first two rounds. 
then we look at the key derivation. We know that the master key is just the 10 first keys. We can get it, and then we have the full key. And we have a full key recovery. So if we do a more accurate uh, complexity analysis, we can actually reduce the complexity a little bit. But what I explained so far will give you this complexity, W times 2364 plus W. We can reduce it a little bit. And actually, what turns out is that the bottleneck is just finding the right pairs. So this uh, first step, we have to find pairs which follow the trend. Then the actual complexity of extracting the key from those pairs will be smaller than uh, finding the pairs. So how do we find the pairs? Uh, the simple, simplest way is just to, to build a big hash table. We put all the pairs in them to just look for uh, collisions, basically. This is nice and efficient. This gives you a, a very small time complexity. The problem is you need a very large memory, and you're going to need this in a random access memory because you make basically random accesses. And uh, so this time complexity is almost practical, but memory of uh, 264 is not really practical. So that, that, that's a kind of problem. So we can look at other options for this step. Um, another simple option is instead of putting this in a hash table, we just store it on disk and then we sort the disk. This will be probably more practical because uh, a disk of a hard drive of size 264 is probably easier. To, well, it's not yet possible to get one. But we'll probably get one uh, before we can get uh, a RAM uh, memory of this size. So it's probably better to use this. And another option is to use some kind of time memory trader. Uh, basically, this is a collision search. So there are very good time memory traders that you can use for this. And then you get uh, this kind of trade-off. If you reduce the memory value factor T, you can you have to open the, the time value factor T. So the basic message is that this attack is almost practical. So it makes sense to look at uh, how you would implement uh, really. So that's uh, the, the key recovery attack. So very nice complexity. And we can go a little. Uh, we can also look at other applications of uh, the, the truncated tray. We're going to look at uh, hash collisions because, uh, like I said earlier, W idea was designed mostly uh, to build a hash function. Out of that. So how do you build a hash function? Well, you use Davis Mayer. So this means that uh, the previous chain value is used at the plain text, then you replicate it, and you XOR the plain text in the same place, and the message is used. So uh, if we want to use a retrocated differential tray, we want to have just a single instance active. So we need to have uh, two chaining values which are almost colliding. So we need a 448-bit collision. So this will be a bit expensive, but it's still cheaper than finding a full collision. So it's, uh, it's good. We can, we can assume that we have that we have one, one such pair of chaining values. When we get this, what we can do is just take a random message block and compute the output of the block cipher. And with some probability, this random message block, when you take those two chaining values, this is going to follow the path, and then you get the same uh, pattern of the output. So this probability is 2 to minus 28, so you have to pay this in order to follow the train. And then when you go for a feed forward, you have this difference and this difference. So with some probability, they're going to cancel out again. And then you have to pay 2 to minus 64 for this. It's a bit expensive, but it's still cheaper than, uh, than the full collision attack. What you get is with very, very simple collision algorithm. So first thing is to find uh, a collision in 448 bits. And then you just iterate with random messages. So it's very, very nice and simple uh, collision algorithm. It's, uh, what's really funny is that it's completely independent of the message expansion. So it's a collision attack in the hash function. We don't even look at the message expansion uh, of the block cipher. So that, that's a bit surprising. But you can easily extend it if you want to use a chosen prefix, if you want to use uh, meaningful messages. That's very easy because uh, the attack is still so simple. <clears throat> so uh, to, conclude over, uh, to conclude my talk, what we did in this work was look at truncated differential trace for a W idea, and it turns out that we can have very, very efficient truncated trace because the diffusion across the instances is with this MTS matrix, and the problem is that the input uh, of the SCS matrix is just too small. You just have 16 bit inputs of a diffusion, and that's, that's just too small. You can easily get it. Now, thanks to this, we get uh, two different attacks. The first one, the key recovery, which is uh, Actually, a very strong key recovery. It only cost 270 or 271 for a block cipher which is supposed to have security of 512 or even to the 1024. And the second application is uh, hash collisions. And we get full collisions in the hash functions for a cost of 2 to the 24 instead of 2 to the 26. So, uh, thank you for your attention.